Kelly Anderson, co-chair of the Women in Philanthropy Education Committee, and I'm co-chairing with Dr. Thea Sawicki, and I really would like to thank Thea for really all the great work she's done for the committee for this event. Um, she really is, uh, she's really the workhorse, so we really appreciate it. Um, special welcome to the members of Women in Philanthropy, the University of Toledo Retirees Association, folks from the College of Nursing, and certainly some of the volunteers that are here from UTMC and, and our guests. And it's now my pleasure to introduce, to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Lewandowski has over three decades of experience as an academic educator, administrator, researcher, clinician, and consultant with positions of increasing responsibility. She is a nurse and a clinical psychologist. Dr. Lewandowski has extensive experience in program and curriculum development, strategic planning, program management at the undergraduate level through the PhD levels. Her work reflects a strong focus on social justice and healthcare for underserved and disadvantaged populations. She's also a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. In July of 17, Dr. Lewandowski assumed the role of Dean and Professor at the University of Toledo's College of Nursing. She was appointed co-chair of the UT President's Opioid Task Force in 17, and she continues in that role. And in 2019, the added role of the Vice Provost for Health Affairs and Interprofessional and Community Partnerships. Some focus areas in the Vice Provost role include leading the Mental Health Response Team, the Social Determinants of Health Working Group, and serving as a member of the University Pandemic Operations Committee. She is formerly a tenured professor in the College of Nursing at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, where she was also the Dean of Academic Affairs. She served as an Assistant Dean for Family, Community, and Mental Health at Wayne State University College of Nursing with a joint appointment at the WSU and Children's Hospital of Michigan. And previous to that position, she held academic posts at Johns Hopkins and Yale universities. Her research has focused on violence and cumulative trauma in high risk groups and in high risk situations. She developed the cumulative trauma scale, now co-developed the cumulative trauma scale, now translated into six languages and used worldwide. She's been a national leader in patient and family-centered care and co-authoring co a work that has helped change practice. She earned her BSN from the University of Michigan, an MS degree in pediatric critical care nursing from the University of California, San Francisco, an MS from, in psychology and a PhD in clinical psychology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst, and completed a postdoctorate fellowship at Yale University. <laughs> Yeah. Recent national leadership includes former co-chair of the Child, Adolescent, and Family Expert Panel of the American Academy of Nursing, and she currently serves as president of the International Network for Doctoral Education in Nursing. So we're really thrilled to have joining us today the UT Dean of the College of Nursing and Vice Provost for Health Affairs for Inter Interprofessional and Community Partnerships, Dr. Linda Lewandowski. Welcome. Thanks. Phew, that was a lot. Thanks, Kelly. <laughs> Let me see. Oh, I have to get this little thing to say. Got it. Okay. Well, I'm really excited to be with you today. And I'm, I'm excited that we're anticipating 50 years in the College of Nursing, really the anniversary's next year. So we're getting a jump start. So I am going to call upon all of you, because I think we have some collective knowledge in this room, to really help us really get the uh, history of the College of Nursing kind of fluffed out. So we did a great um, first stab at it, and I want to thank Jody Jameson from the library, and Hilly Phillips, Kathy Mitchell, Eileen Walsh, who all kicked in and kind of did an initial uh, assessment of all of the information we needed. And then I've kind of called on other people to help fill in more. They kept, we were getting emails last night going, what year did such and such happen, whatever. So I'm going to invite some of you who lived this experience to feel free to kind of share some of your recollections 
Um, if you have some thoughts about what was happening at the time when I talk about some of the evolution of the College of Nursing, um, I'd love to hear about some of your memories. And also after this talk, if there are some things that, some areas you think, wow, I can really fill in some more information about this. We have time because we have till 2024, right? So by that time with our collective knowledge, and memory, I think we can have a really comprehensive 50 year analysis of where the College of Nursing has come from. And we'll talk a little bit about where I kind of see it going. I'm gonna share a little bit of some recent history of what kinds of things we've been doing. So I'm going to invite you, as I said, to share with me and go down kind of memory lane here. Okay, so now, First of all, I have to figure out how to make this happen. Remember that thing where it wasn't working? <laughs> okay, oh. no, it is. All I need to do is. She threatened him enough. <laughs> so, as I said, we're facing a landmark, you know, 50 year golden anniversary of the College of Nursing in 2024. And I'll tell you how we calculate that because that wasn't the very beginning of the College of Nursing but it was University of Toledo's beginning with the College of Nursing. So early beginnings began in 1969 with the hire of a new um, dean who was going to come and Ruth Kelly was hired from Cornell University to come and plan this new College of Nursing. This was an early, um, Newspaper article from The Blade, this was around back then, yes. It, November 4th, 1969, announcing her hire and a bunch of other university hires too. Okay, okay. I'm gonna have to threaten it again, I'm not sure. Just I tried there. that. Oh, that oh. didn't work. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, so okay. Now we see. It should. Um, and you know why? That's so weird. I don't know why. Let's try. Oh, this. we have to get rid of that, but it's yeah, not showing up not here. Showing here. You know what? Right. It's only showing up on the screen, but not in here. So Where? Oh, let's see. We probably I'm have to dongle this little thing here. And we'll try it again. Okay. That's very funny. It's showing up in the screen, but not on the computer. So yeah. there's no way to get rid of it. Yeah. So, you know, these are just, yeah. aren't we so used to these technical things? You know, we just go, oh, yeah, yeah we've done this for the last 30 years. Yeah. Let's see. I'm trying to see if there's a way here to. Let's stop it and then share it again. Try it out. Stop share. Mm -hmm. Stop share and then, and then okay, and then go back and share share screen again. There it goes. Right here. And then go to your. You want to go? Uh, yeah. All right. Now. Okay. This. Now let's see. Okay. Oh. Yeah. I try. Well, let's make sure it's actually on. Anybody know Ruth Kelly? Did some of you know Dr. Kelly? Yeah, did you have um, any some memories of Dr. Dean Kelly while we're trying to move on and learn more about her? And <laughs> I'll get some battery. And uh, what are some of your recollections about Dean Kelly? And somebody, can somebody take all these notes down so we don't lose this great historical knowledge? She, uh, she came from Canada, New York, of course, and um, she was very precise about everything she did. And I um, had that expectation of just rest, of course. Um, she did very well mixing with other people and 
She makes her own well with the very good. No, also in the reason of the world. She, she was an individual all of her own. She wore her hair, took her child, and most of us wore our hair. Never changed the shape of the hair. If I ever get to show you the picture, I'll show you. Uh-huh. Great, thanks. I, some other people said they, other people raised your hands that you also knew Dean Kelly. Oh, did you have something else to say? I'm sorry, thought you were wrapping up. Yeah. Okay, I think there are a couple other people who raised their hand too that you knew Dean Kelly. Were there some other people? Don, Ann. And Thea, you I did? I had the honor of working with all five of the first groups. And Dr. Kelly, the, the funny story I can tell you about Dr. Kelly is that I began here in 1977. <laughs> but in 1975, she offered me a position. And what she wanted me to do is put together the pediatric and OB programs, as well as partially within the clinical programs in psychiatric nursing. And I told her I wasn't qualified to do that. Hmm. And she wasn't I happy. Yeah. But I, I, I asked my colleague to see if he could come back. However, two years later, I was more experienced. And I interviewed uh, with her. And two of my uh, two persons who became colleagues of mine, hmm. um, Joanne Schwartzberg. I see there's somebody in the chat, but I'm not seeing it. Needed so. a third faculty member to help teach their leadership portion of the program. Okay, it's just and so I was talking to them and I said, I don't think Dr. Kelly will hire you because she wasn't happy two years ago. And they said, whatever she offers you, just tell her you can do it. So I interviewed with Dr. Kelly and she said, I need someone to teach leadership and critical care. So, and I said, what's going on? So um, it's not even it's not so she advanced. Sort of sat there I just changed out the bathroom. Or by the air, I'll tell you. Literally, every day, I even tried, you know, the students. Okay. From an hour to an hour and a half. So, you're showing me. Know all about the patients, know all about the students. And really, it was a bonded quarter for me because it was teaching something that I had about 25% of my children. Okay, for me. She was very concerned. There we go. And um, but she was a leader. She was really a leader. And those were the days that we had a we were beginning or we were into uh, an early consortium book. In fact, Matt, wasn't there a faculty member from um, the academic portion of the program that drove the school bus to Bowling Green every day to pick up the students? Yeah, I can't remember who, but the students actually came back and forth by school bus. So, lots of other stories about great. Yeah. Yep, here she is. So, these are some of the recollections of Dean Kelly that she was instrumental in developing the innovative consortium model between MCO and BGSU. So, many of you may know UT was not in the picture in the initial days. The consortium and the first approval of the BSN program was to Bowling Green State University. She, um, in 1974, though, the University of Toledo joined the consortium. Thus, we're celebrating 1974 as 50 years of the UT College of Nursing. But in reality, the program started a little bit before that. So she directed the initial program accreditation 
She established a center for continuing nursing education, kind of enlarging the view. And then in 1978, she established the RN to BSN program. So she was an innovator and person who started a lot of things. Oh, jeez. Okay, this is the first College of Nursing pin. And as you can see, it reflects the original UT, BGSU, and MCO consortium. One of the things I wasn't able to find is how long that pin went, well, I guess well, after the MCO merger, but then some other nursing pins have cropped up. The one over the gold one is the associate degree pin and the gold, the other gold, I guess that's more bronze, gold one, is the current pin, which as you can see, maybe, I guess you can, it's big enough, has BGSU and UT. And so as I will talk about in a few minutes, we are now pretty dissolved in that consortium that was very long lasting. So we're gonna have to revise our pin and Kathy and I were just looking at how we're gonna have to make some changes on that as we go. But the history of the nursing pins is one area that if somebody is really interested in scouting out, when did we change? Was there a pin in between? What, you know, that... Okay, so the history of the nursing pins is something we haven't quite figured out. So dot that down is one thing that would be good to fill out in the history of this. So now I want to talk about some pioneers and we have one of them here. Dr. Donahue is with us. So Dr. Donahue was the first faculty member in the MCO College of Nursing, School of Nursing, I guess at the time. And in the Guyton, Simmons and Cordyce book, she described her early days with this quote, in which you might remember saying this, it was the best of times and the worst of times. In two short months, we designed a curriculum, set up a practice laboratory, negotiated clinical laboratory assignments for the students, and created a basic library on two campuses. These were some busy women, uh, MCO and BGSU. 25 students, women and men, arrived in the September of 1971. We had limited finances with which to function. Well, okay, some things never change. Dr. Hunt, Donahue, do you want to have any just recollections of being the very first? Was there more of you or was it pretty much you and Dean Kelly? Did you have other faculty members? That's okay. It was the first one, but a month later, Mary Simmons. Okay. Dennis Kelly at Dermatologist of Central State. If this is a medical emergency, it's please hang up and dial 911 or go to your nearest nice. emergency room. If you would like to schedule an appointment online, please visit dermatologyappointment.com. <laughs> To speak to our billing department, please press one. If you'd like to be transferred to an office receptionist, please press two. Thank you. Thank you for calling Dermatologist of Greater Columbus, an affiliate of Dermatologist of Central State. If this is a medical emergency, please hang up and dial 911 or go to your nearest emergency room. If you would like to schedule an appointment online, please visit dermatologyappointment.com. To speak to our building department, please Thanks. press 1. If you would like to be transferred to an office receptionist, please press 1. Uh huh. So she gave you a new challenge to do. Huh? All right. Okay. Right. So I'm just going to say for the people online. 
they then developed the continuing education program. Uh -huh. So she knew her people and she knew when you needed a new challenge and that's great. Thank you. So another person that I want to recognize as a pioneer is Mary Beth Hayward. Um, Mary Beth Hayward joined the MCO School of Nursing Faculty in 1974. She helped set up the consortium too. Some of you might recall. She later became an associate professor and director of the RN to BSN track and coordinator of the RN outreach program. She also helped establish the local chapter of Sigma Theta Tau. So it had kind of some early beginnings and she's fondly remembered for her love of teaching. Former Dean Jerry Milstead recalled she had a powerful, gigantic influence on people during her 30 years of teaching. Some people know Mary Beth also. Yeah. So another person is Deborah Buckman. And I know some of you also know Dr. Buckman. She was a passionate expert on nursing research, evidence-based practice, and biostatistics. She encouraged students to pursue scholarly nursing activities and work diligently to support faculty with their research. Mentored new faculty in their early career, was a SBSS guru apparently, served as the director of the Center for Nursing Research and Evaluation taught in the DNP program. And one of her great legacies is the College of Nursing Research Day, which we've now morphed into an interprofessional research day in this day and age, but um, she was really instrumental in having that early underpinnings. She was a prolific researcher and published a number of peer-reviewed articles, and her le legacy lives on through the Deborah Buckman Research Fund, which even now um, gives funds for faculty and students to support their research and evidence-based practice. So that's a great legacy, and we always invite people to remember her to maybe donate to that fund to really help keep promoting the research work that she did. So these are the deans of the College of Nursing. I'm number eight. Um, definitely Ruth Kelly. Grace Chickadons was going to be with us today and she wasn't feeling well. So we um, unfortunately didn't get to have Dr. Chickadons here. But if you're listening online, we, we miss you. Yes. Oh, Deanna Stiedegren was going to be here today. I'm sorry. Wrong person. Jumping ahead. Start with a C. So Deanna Stiedegren is going to be here today. She's not here. Joyce Shoemaker was 1988 to 98. Um, Jerry Milstead, I know a lot of you knew Jerry, Tim Gaspar, Kelly Phillips, who's with us, was interim for two years, and then I came in 2017. So we do have a, a wall that is partially completed <laughs> that um, kind of outlines the contributions of each of the deans. And I'm going to kind of move us along here, but as we go in the uh, 50th anniversary, we'll be kind of having materials to deal out to detail out some of the contributions of each of the deans. So these are really wordy slides and I kind of have taken them from uh, various timelines. So I'm just gonna kind of run through some of the high points of a timeline for each of our programs. Um, so as I said, the initial planning was started in 1969 when Dr. Kelly was hired. Approval to offer the BSN through BGSU was attained in 1970. Initial implementation in 71, then OBN gave conditional approval to go ahead and start getting students. Um, then in 1974, the University of Toledo came on board and became a member of the consortium. Um, 1974, BGSU actually graduated the first students from their university, 18 students, and the first UT students were admitted to the consortium. Um, a lot of approvals as we go through the years from the um, Ohio Board of Nursing and Ohio Board of Regents. We then um, obtained initial accreditation for eight years from then the NLN, which was the big accreditor at that period of time, which many of you may recall. Um, then we moved to the CCNE, the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education for Accreditation, 
um, things we're kind of running through for the next almost 20 years don't have a lot of historic timelines during that time. So if there are some things we need to add in here regarding the BSN program, please let us know. Um, in 2009, 10-year accreditation was obtained for the BSN program and the Orange BSN, the free licensure, like all of the programs. And then in 2018, the decision was made, not by me, I wanna just say, to dissolve the consortium that came from the provost at the time. And um, so we began the process of dissolving the consortium. BGSU began the process of planning and ultimately opening their own school of nursing. Um, in 2019, though, we were still running both programs. And so when we had accreditation come, they said, you don't have approval for the University of Toledo baccalaureate program. And I'm like, okay, we've been doing this for like 40 some years. And they're like, no, your consortium has been teaching students for that long. University of Toledo never had a BSN program. So we had to apply for a new BSN program, which was the exact same program as the consortium. And in CCNE's own wisdom, they sent two separate accrediting teams. So we had two teams that we had to juggle over the course of time that they were here. Both of the teams looking at exactly the same curriculum, clinical sites, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and both of the teams approved the BSM program. So thank heaven for that. Um, so we got 10 year reapproval of our BSN and all of our, our masters and DMP program at that time. Um, but initial five year accreditation of our UT only BSN program, because that's as most you can get for a new program. So we actually are just starting to work on that um, interim report so we can get another five years accreditation of our UT only BSN program. This summer, um, we will see our last BGSU um, student graduate. It's kind of a, a sad end of an era, I think, for many of us. But yeah. I could if I really understood it, but I really don't. I have to say, even this time, I'm not sure exactly why Provost Xu made that decision. At the time, I thought it was coming from the president. And in later talking to her, she thought it was coming from me because it was too um, much to do or something. And I'm like, I never wanted that. And she's like, well, it wasn't me. And so we didn't really totally understand why. And then if you recall, there was some politics and bad blood between BGSU and UT, not really related to nursing. They put a billboard up on Door Street and that really antagonized our administration and they were doing things like trying to come into Toledo, which we didn't, our university did not want BGSU. Toledo was University of Toledo's university. So there was a wider context. And by the time that all died down and I'm like, oh, can I go back and really try to, you know, mend fences? Um, and when I got the okay, they were like, well, too bad, we're too far in our planning. So it's sort of one of those fluky things that I'm not positive there was a great reason. And when I talk to President Rogers, or he'll say, well, it was you, you guys who did this, you know, it was you guys who did this. And I can't really argue with him, but, um, but it is what it is. So we will be kind of closing the, the picture on that story um, in the summer, in the last one. So back to more exciting, positive things. This is the first home, and those of you who were there will recall the first nursing academic offices and classrooms were in the former Maumee Valley Hospital School of Nursing. It's now the Area Office on Aging, by the way. But then the college moved to the Mulford Library building. That was in 1978. So some of you were probably there. And then in 1996, there was the groundbreaking for the new Collier building. And the College of Nursing then, here's the groundbreaking, then it moved into our current home, which is in the Collier building. Um, and we shared that with the um, 
PA students and some pharmacy students and med students go through there. It's kind of a, an interprofessional building, um, but we do have our own space there, including the learning resource oops, center. Um, one of the things that we've done during my time here is we had increased enrollment and we had to add a few more labs in skills practice areas down in the basement of the Learning Resource Center. And we kind of moved over across the way behind the elevators, if some of you know where that is, to get more lab space for our students. So we're very fortunate to have a number of spaces, a number of mannequins, um, great learning uh, center in our building. In addition, in 2016, the Lloyd A. Jacobs Interprofessional Inter-Immersive Simulation Center was completed. And this is a shared resource for all the health science students. I think we have engineering students and a few other college students there too. Have, a, have most of you been in the um, simulation center? So you kind of know the, um, you know, this is like a futuristic looking lobby. And then these areas were the CAD walls and these 3D great idea of technology places that in reality, we never really used a whole lot because it's great to have the technology, but you have to have the curriculum that behind it. And we really never implemented um, in any of the health science colleges really to the extent that possibly they could have been, and then they don't really work anymore. So we're kind of in the process of retooling what we're gonna do with those spaces. But the, the simulation center is a very vital place for nursing medicine, in particular, we're the biggest users, um, to learn skills. Like here we have the learning central line insertion, laparoscopy, suturing, and surgical techniques. And we do have um, physicians and surgeons from the community and uh, various places come in to use our surgical procedure laboratories. We also do have wet labs where cadavers are put into play. So we do have learning opportunities um, really across the board in the Sim Center. Additionally, which is the most exciting thing we for us, I think, um, is we have the opportunity to do actual simulations, case simulations. So this is the control room. It's kind of my favorite place um, to be in the Sim Center and to really watch things happen. Surrounded by four of these clinical rooms, pediatric room, OB room, you know, critical care and regular or something. Um, but we have the opportunity to do nursing simulations for our nursing students with debriefings and then also interprofessional simulations. So every Wednesday, there's a code um, practice that students are just invited to come to interprofessionally and learn about working together as a team. So it's great that you've all kind of seen the Center Center because that's really one of our gems of our campus. This is like a quick timeline and then I'm gonna get into more detail, but um, this is what nursing students looked like in the 1970s when you kind of were getting things started. And many of us remember the CAP days. I was at the University of Michigan and we had a smaller CAP, but one of my most memorable experiences was being on the ward when they still had those TVs with the rabbit ears and doing a sterile procedure as a new student stepping backward and getting my cat caught in the rabbit ear. And I was sterile, so I couldn't move because you can't contaminate yourself. And so I was just immobilized until my instructor got me untangled from the rabbit ear. So we probably all have our great cap stories that we can remember the guys didn't have to do cap. So um, that was one thing they didn't have to do. But anyway, now we're into the pins and the stethoscope and lab coats. So these are some of the historic events. 1982, Sigma chapter was chartered. 1982 to the Center for Nursing Research. Um, 1994 was the first nurse practitioner program. I'm gonna talk about all these programs in more detail. 2006 was very historic. That was the merger um, 
of Medical College and University in the University of Toledo. And I have to say, for some people, it seems that the merger did not happen. When I came in 2017, people were talking about MCO and everything. And I thought it had happened maybe like the year before. And actually it had been what, 11 years <laughs> when I came and now it's like 17 years. Um, but for some people, you know, it's always gonna be MCO and, and that doesn't go away. But that's really the, um, the time that the University of Toledo kind of took over the whole shebang there. Um, 2007, we started our NDMP consortium with Wright State University. We're a big consortium college, which is kind of exciting. We're big collaborators. They work for a while and then they don't. Um, and then let's see, we got the first uh, baccalaureate to DMP program. And then more recently, we just had the acute care gerontology program. So those were some general high points. I'm gonna talk a little bit about each of the programs, not reading to this to you in all great detail, but I want to talk um, in general about the evolution of our various programs. Our RNTBSN program um, was first offered in 1981 at various um, outreach sites in an online lo on site location. And then in 2002, it converted to online. And then in 2018, the RNTBSN track was chosen by central administration to be the first competency-based education program at the University of Toledo. And we have a very um, innovative faculty group who was willing to jump in and develop that and to learn this modality. And they've done just a fantastic job. We were the first RNTBSN competency-based program at a public university in Ohio, one of those out-of-state big groups came in too, but we were the first um, public university in 2019. We have a lot of good support for that centrally with instructional designers, UT Online. It really kind of takes a village to do a, an innovative program like competency-based education. Um, so just to run through how we do CBE, this is a very self-paced, individualized program. It's asynchronous online, so there's not in-person meetings at any time. They, um, anytime during the first nine weeks of our semester, a student can decide that they want to take a course and they can finish it when they finish it. So we have some students who will um, sign up for course, uh, finish it in maybe three or four weeks, and then sign up for another course and then finish that one. Some students take some courses concurrently. You can finish this program in two semesters, 10 um, courses, if you're really um, Johnny on the spot. And we've had some students do that, primarily military students who that's their assignment is to kind of get through this in two semesters. Um, but we are very excited also that just this year, we've now had all 10 of our courses, Quality Matters certified. So if you're not familiar with Quality Matters, it's a I think of it, and some of you will be of the generation who will remember the good housekeeping seal of approval. Remember that? Yes, yeah, so that's what I think of it as, is the good housekeeping seal of approval for online programs. It's really a mark of excellence and quality, and we're the only program um, to have all of our courses be uncertified. So we're very proud about that and the excellence that that reflects. So this is a lot about the, the MSM program. I'm not going to read all of this, but this gives you an idea of how many MSN programs we've had. Um, in 1980 was um, the first time the Master of Science degree in nursing was offered and 10 students were admitted. We started out with community nursing, gerontology nursing, med surge, and psych. These were CNS programs at the time, if you all remember. Nurse practitioner wasn't really a thing back then. Many of us were CNSs. I was Pete CNS too back in my day. Oh, clinical nurse specialist. Yeah, so that was a role that was going to be, that was a clinical expert, consultant, doing quality care, excellence on the units, being a resource, following um, specialized um, groups of patients. When I was a clinical nurse specialist at Yale New Haven Hospital, I followed the liver transplant 
of population across settings, you know, we kind of critical care. So it depended on, you know, how to enact that. But it was a, an early role, um, senior nurse person before we had nurse practitioners. I know, is that pretty good for those of you who have CNSs? Is that, is that okay? Pardon me? That's what many of us wanted to be was nurse practitioners. Right, well, we didn't have nurse practitioners at the time, right? And so then that evolved. Um, so then we added nursing education and nurse management tracks here and then parent-child nursing. And then in 1992, did a joint nurse administration with the College of Business. And then finally got a nurse practitioner uh, track in 1994. The family nurse practitioner track was approved in 2000. Um, we approved the graduate certificate. So if you already had a, a master's degree, you could come back and get a certificate. You didn't have to get another degree as a nurse practitioner. Um, and also the BSN nurse educator certificate. And then in 2002, we added the pediatric nurse practitioner and adult nursing practitioner, adult nurse practitioner tracks. Then we added the uh, graduate certificate, the psych mental health nurse track practitioner, um, took that up through all of the certificates. And in 2019, we got accreditation for, oh, that was like everybody, all our programs were reaccredited by CCNE in 2019. And then in 2019, later that year, we got approval for adult Jiro Acute Care Nurse Practitioner Program. So that was just um, pre-pandemic. We had a thought that that was gonna be the most attended program because there were like 70 nurses, even just at ProMedica who were practicing in acute care settings, although they were primary care certified. And while the Ohio board is kind of allowing that right now, that's really kind of practicing out of scope of practice. So they're gonna to have to come back and get an acute care certification. And we thought, wow, this is great. And then we just got it all launched. And what happened? The pandemic happened. <laughs> and so all of those nurses were now front lines on the job, just trying to survive in their clinical places. So we had a very slow start to the acute care nurse practitioner track. And we are just sort of coming out of that because the, the nurses, as many of you know, who know sort of working nurses during the pandemic, you know, the staffing, it was just, things were overwhelming. They were just trying to survive and to help people survive. Going to school was not really something they could do in addition in their life. So we had a lot of students put it on hold, not come in, stop, and we're just sort of starting to see students come back. So also during this time, our enrollment in our nurse, nurse educator program was declining. There are two other nurse educator programs just in our city at Mercy and Lords. And we decided that we didn't need to have three programs. We would say for the two or three students who wanted it, you could go to one of those other places, but come here if you want nurse practitioner, because we have all the nurse practitioner uh, specialties. So then we, another exciting track that we have is the graduate entry into nursing track. So for people who have a degree in another field, uh, but decided they wanted to become a nurse, in 2003, the Gemini track was started. And I guess it's graduate entry nursing. I don't know what the INI stands for. Anybody know? Graduate entry, master's in nursing and nursing. Okay, thank you. I knew. Kelly would know. Um, that got fully approved in 2005, and they graduated their students that year. Then it was changed into a clinical nurse leader program, which was another kind of advanced nursing role, but not an advanced practice nursing role. It was like that until we had our accreditation visit in 2019. We found in this geographical area, there are not a lot of jobs that are for clinical nurse. Um, leaders, other parts of the country, that is a role in healthcare centers, not so much in the Midwest. So we didn't have a lot of students taking the certification exam. Our accreditors are like, well, why are you kind of doing this specialty? You know, that's not really training them for the workforce needs. So we changed it to a, changed our curriculum, made it 
more current, not doing the clinical nurse leader, but being more of a, a, a uh, resource. It's an accelerated program where they become a nurse and they get all of the basic nursing so they can take the uh, licensing exam, but they also get a master's degree. So they do a little bit more. And so we changed that into the GEM program in 2020. So it's kind of had an evolution, but is definitely a program that um, meets a need for the adult learner, for somebody who wants to be a nurse, who already has a degree. And we're excited about growing that program. Our doctor of nursing practice started in 2007. Um, it's evolved through having a BSN to DMP, an MSN to DNP, and now we're looking at having a back to DNP program, which is taking high performing high school students and admitting them to the DMP program as we admit them to the basic nursing program. They have to, you know, keep their GPA up and some things, but when we get them, we got them for eight years, you know? <laughs> so um, we've had a really good um, response to that program and we're excited to kind of look at how to really promote that track. We also have evolved to an all online program. And this is something that we really need to look at, especially in a time of low enrollment. We don't have enough nurses in just Northwest Ohio to support all of our educational programs. So if we're online, we can really market across the country and market other kinds of places. And so we're excited about the possibilities this will bring for us. I wanna go through just a couple other um, things. I'm gonna go kind of quickly because we've had some nice discussion time, but I just wanna show you some of the things that we're also very proud of. The Utilito Interprofessional Program started back in 2014. They did a pilot in 2013, I'm told. Um, but this brings students from 11 specialties, healthcare specialties at least, sometimes a few more, uh, about 600 students in the fall, and they all come together and they break up into small groups with faculty from each of the health science um, programs to really learn about each other, to learn how to work as teams, um, to really look at how can we really work together to advance patient care. So this is something many programs, most programs don't have, and we're very excited about that. These are just some pictures of our CCNE accreditation. Marty Sexton, our former associate dean of academic affairs. So if you know, it was, this was like many evenings of long times, which our administrators will share. Um, and we were finally submitted our self-study. Um, and then in, that was in, I don't know, like December of, 2018, I think. They visited us in January of 2019. And then in October, we finally got the final word that we were uh, accredited fully for 10 years, had a little celebration. You can see then President Gaber and Provost Bjorkman came over to share some cake and celebrate with us. Those were, I'm sure, non-alcoholic bubbly things that we're toasting there. Just a few words on the pandemic. We all lived through it. It was quite the experience, you know, for educators doing clinical education. Want to very proudly um, tout that our interprofessional student team led by Dr. Susan Batten administered over 40,000 COVID vaccine doses um, in the community, in the university. They were out everywhere and they really did an amazing um, community service. And as Dr. Batten noted, we knew it was a life-saving effort and many of the students spoke of being part of history and what a meaningful part of their school of nursing journey it was to really give back to the community and to really work um, in this endeavor. They were out in parking lots. They were all over the place. We adapted. This was our um, parking lot graduation. Our students, we felt really needed the opportunity to walk across the stage. And so we, in August, came up with our parking lot graduation. All of the students lined up in their cars. We had this big tent set up and they would stop their car. The student would get out and their families could get out and take pictures. They walked across the stage. They either got hooded or got their certificate. And families took pictures. They got in their car and they moved along and they did a picture. And we did that for a whole lot of students and families. And there was their opportunity to still have a graduation. And we got a lot of thankful um, 
expressions from family members that really wanted to still have an opportunity to celebrate, even given the constraints of the pandemic. This is how we did our white coat ceremonies. We did what, like five or six of them. We do it three times a year. Well, probably more than that because we had the BSN and, and CNLs. This was our backstage staging. We live streamed the um, me and the directors and our speaker. Um, and so they were all on their computers. And then we asked students to submit their own, their um, little video of them getting hooded or getting their um, Cloak, getting cloaked, yes. So you can see that, that some of them made a very special, you know, Sister Maria got her fellow nuns involved. You know, some of the student, another Callahan had, uh, I think that was her mother who was also a nurse who kind of garbed up for the occasion. Some students had their dogs um, bring their coat to them or their kids. You know, it was a very personalized experience. So while we really are happy to be back in person, this was really a special kind of event too. And so we really felt we made the best that we could given the situation. This is just a picture of our faculty. Today, we have around 36, give or take a few faculty, around 15 staff. Um, this is taken an annual picture at our retreat. I just wanna give a shout out to our students. We have amazing students, our National Student Nurses Association. Um, has been around for a while. Not really sure when that started. That's another good question, how long that's been going. Um, but our students have won a lot of um, awards for community service and leadership. And, and somewhere in the 20s, uh, Dr. Tamika Gray, who unfortunately passed away, some of you will recall that in 2021, she was a sad loss for us, started the Multicultural Student Organization that was kind of faltering. And in 2021, Dr. Sharmita Gibbon and some of our students retooled that into the Diversity Nursing Association, the DNA. And that's really rejuvenated more life um, into the whole picture. And they are doing peer mentoring and various programs. So we're excited about our student events. We're also really proud of our student athletes. Not all schools of nursing allow nursing students to participate in Division one athletics, we think it's really important and our student athletes are amazing. They work out organization, time management. And um, this, the top picture was a, a little dinner we had with some of our swimmers and field, track and field. We have tennis. We have, um, I'll talk about Hannah in a minute. Um, and so many different sports, um, men's and women's track. We, so, we do have Hannah Navrosky, who is a who is on our women's basketball team, which as you recall, did really well this year. But um, in twenty one, in January of twenty one, I was I recall I was like at home, and at nine thirty at night, I get a call from Trisha Cullop, who doesn't usually call me on Sunday night at nine thirty. So I'm like, hi. She's like, I have this problem. You know, I just found out the white coat ceremony is, you know, this day. And Hannah's, we have a home game. And, you know, what am I to do? I don't want her to miss it. And so anyway, I said, well, okay, what if we brought that to her? What if we bring a white coat ceremony to her? So we made that nurse appreciation night. We invited nurses from the community. Um, UTMC brought about 50 nurses. We had a white coat. This is the group that we had our regular ceremony at the bottom. And then we went to the uh, Savage, we did a white coat ceremony on center court. And I never would have thought I would see the Nightingale Pledge up on the Jumbotron, but we invited all nurses in the audience to reaffirm the Nightingale Pledge with us. And it was an incredible, just three minute, but very remarkable experience. So I'm, I kind of share that because this is kind of, you know, we really try to make things work. Our coaches do and we do to really support our students. This is the um, annual Dottie Hussein Distinguished Lectureship. Hopefully some of you go to this. You know, it's been a long time. I know Anne was a very close friend of Dottie and the family. This endowed lectureship has really allowed us to really cover some really important late breaking issues. We started with suicide the first year I was here. We've covered health disparities in COVID and cardiovascular care, transgender health, LGBT, health issues. This past fall, we looked at disparities in maternal infant care and the uh, disproportionately high mortality of African-American women. So 
we're very excited about this as part of our history. The rocket nursing camp just started this past summer. Dr. Mitchell up there is the instigator of this whole thing. It was very successful. This is our initial camp in 2022. And this year we're gonna have two camps with 80 campers. We have done kind of a help us support, help us support this so we can keep the prices low for the students coming to this camp. This is a recruitment for high school students trying to get them to say, yes, you really do wanna be a nurse. So we're excited about that. One of the things for Dr. Walsh, I wanna make sure that you know, we, we do focus on our students, but we also have had a strong focus on scholarship and we've increased even during the pandemic, which is pretty amazing, our faculty publications and presentations, um, a few grant submissions, not as much as we'd like, but we'll hopefully get there, looking at partnerships with ProMedica and UTMC um, to do some joint EBP projects. We're really worked on increasing our national leadership and visibility. And one of the reasons, one of the ways we know that has been happening is our US News and World Report rankings for our master's program, we were number 183 when I first came here. And now five years later, I think after that, um, we're number 92. And that's really based a lot on visibility. And so I, I'm really proud of that. You know, I think that really shows we've made some significant process, progress. And we're also looking at trying to reconstitute our continuing education offerings. We're getting ready for a new licensing exam called the Next Gen, Next Generation exam. So the NCLEX licensing exam went away in April. This group taking the exam now will be the first across the nation to do the new exam. So none of us are sure what's gonna happen. We're hoping that we're educating students for this new exam, but we're all waiting to see what will happen. We're also building a labyrinth. And this is like, yay, women in philanthropy. And yay, Dr. Waltz. We're excited about that. It got a little bit held up with the pandemic and things, but you know, we're hoping to get that going this summer. And it's just going to be a wonderful, peaceful contemplation, stress management area. We hope to have a few benches and flowers around there to, um, for our students, our faculty, but also our UTMC staff and patients. So we really just want to say appreciate you all. Thank you for supporting that. And it's going to happen. So some of our challenges and aspirations for the future. Navigating budget cuts is hard, not going to lie. We do have a lot of challenges in the university um, with our budget right now, with our overall low enrollment, but we're really looking how we can best leverage our resources to support our students and faculty. We have action plans and growth plans for all of our programs to look at um, how can we do some new programs, how can we really tap into new markets. Um, one of the programs that we're looking at is a certificate in aesthetics, which is like giving Botox, stuff like that. Hot market for that right now. So we're going to hopefully be the first program to help really train people doing that. Promoting scholarship, increasing our interprofessional programs, our clinical partnerships, growing our alumni development and fundraising activities, and really looking at now that we can travel again, um, trying to grow our study abroad and global outreach. We're actually having very active international recruitment and we'll be having more international students. So despite a lot of challenges over the years, I think we can say the next 50 years of UToledo is going to be bright. And we have so many incredible students that are our future. So I wanna just wanna thank again, Dara Mouch, the University Archivist, Jody, Jameson, Kathy, Kelly, Eileen, Susan Batten, who gave me info, and all the people who contributed, and all of you for being here today and contributing your memories. So go Rocket Nursing. And I know I kind of used up our time, but are there any just pressing questions or comments that any of you would like to make? Yes, sir. What's the the status of your male-female ratio over the 50 years? Well, I'm not sure in the beginning of the 50 years, but Kathy, do you have, I think we're about 15, 13% male in our BSN. 
Right. So, you know, we, we got over 10%. We're still kind of getting there. I don't know what it was originally, though. That's another good question. Somebody, when we're looking at, you know, can we track the diversity in our programs over time? Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. It's been really fun going down memory lane with you all. Thanks for sharing your thoughts and have a wonderful week. And thank you for the people who are online. <laughs>